Yeah, so our uh, institute, uh, Sequest, uh, is the more like the theoretical and phenomenological uh, research we are doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the uh, topics we are doing is the so modified gravity. So maybe uh, uh, from that side, uh, that would be also nice to hear the, some new experimental uh -huh. research and uh, some yes. something like yes. that. Yes, I mean, pulsar timing array data, PTA data, um, is also interesting and relevant mm -hmm. in searches for modified gravity. Uh, today, I will not say much about it. I will focus mm -hmm. on uh, new physics beyond the standard model of particle physics, so basically new particle physics. But for instance, um, you can also use PTA data to test things like massive gravity and new polarization states uh, of gravitational waves. All of this can be done uh, with pulsar data. Okay, I see. I see. Okay, so one minute remain, but the, uh, okay, welcome everybody. Maybe uh, we have still one minute more, but uh, welcome everybody to our secret seminar. Uh, this seminar was uh, actually uh, uh, organized uh, from by me and also uh, our former member Lu In from APCTP. So because of that, uh, I think the that's good chance the uh, 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 Lu will be a special chair today. Okay, so Lu, uh, can you introduce uh, speaker and? Yeah. I will give um, Professor uh, Kai uh, Smith is a faculty of University of Munster. And uh, uh, because of recently, uh, the new result of nanohertz gravitational wave from the nanogram 50, 15 years result, that is a super uh, exciting and a hot topic in theoretical physics. Uh, especially uh, the Professor Smith is uh, one of the main author in that uh, theoretical paper. So uh, today we are very honored to invite uh, Professor Kai uh, Schmitz to uh, introduce the new result about the new physics from the uh, nanograph PTA. Uh, yeah, Professor Smith, please start your presentation. Okay, yeah, great. Um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and also thanks again uh, for the very kind invitation. I'm uh, very happy to be uh, with you today here on Zoom and have the opportunity to talk about uh, some of our latest results. As you just heard, uh, I'm a member of the Nanograv uh, PTA uh, collaboration. Um, PTAs are pulsar timing arrays. I will introduce uh, PTAs in more detail later in the talk. Um, uh, and they provide a means to search for gravitational waves at very low frequencies, nanohertz gravitational waves, uh, which are gravitational waves with wavelength of the order of uh, several light years. Uh, and Nanograv is the North American Nanohertz Observatory uh, for Gravitational Waves. It's one of the existing uh, PTAs. And Nanograv and other PTAs have recently uh, released their latest results. In fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago at the end of June, these have been some very exciting news. Uh, and I will give you a short introduction uh, to those um, uh, latest results uh, in this talk, uh, and then also focus on our contribution uh, to these results. Um, so this is the work that has been done here uh, in Münster, uh, in collaboration with other Nanograv members, uh, notably also um, Andrea Mitridate at DESI uh, in Hamburg. Uh, and our contribution was the search for signals uh, from new physics, uh, as you can also see here in the title of the talk. All right, but before we um, talk about um, PTAs and new physics, let's go uh, one step back uh, and talk about gravitational waves um, in more general terms. So I think it's fair to say that they have now really opened a new window uh, onto uh, the universe. Let me just briefly recap um, the history of uh, gravitational uh, wave uh, physics, past, present, uh, and future. And I will just do it, I will keep it very short and do it here uh, on one slide. So uh, as many or all of you know, I guess, um, gravitational waves have been uh, predicted by Albert Einstein uh, himself uh, in 1916, based on his theory uh, of general relativity. 
Uh, and then, um, well, I, in this talk, I don't really have the time to go through all the different developments um, uh, uh, in the field of gravitational wave physics uh, during the 20th century. So let me just uh, skip fast forward uh, to 2016. So pretty much exactly a century after Einstein, the first direct detection of gravitational waves was announced uh, by the LIGO experiment, LIGO collaboration uh, in the US. Uh, LIGO um, had been using uh, two detectors and is still operating two detectors to search for gravitational waves in Livingston and Hanford. Uh, and those LIGO detectors uh, had spotted the first gravitational wave event um, the year before, so in 2015, uh, this is the name of the gravitational wave event. It reached the LIGO detectors, uh, as you can see here, on the 14th of uh, September 2015. And this was, of course, a major breakthrough in the field of gravitational physics. Now, for the first time, uh, there was a direct detection of gravitational waves in a ground-based experiment. Um, now, the gravitational wave event seen by LIGO and all the other events seen since then by LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA um, are of ast astrophysical origin. So they are consistent with the interpretation in terms of astrophysical merger events, uh, in most cases, the merger of binary black holes. But we've also seen um, events that can be interpreted or explained as um, binary neutron star mergers or mergers of neutron stars and black holes. So these are astrophysical events, and they are transient events, uh, which means that the signal reaches the detectors uh, stays in the detector for a fraction of a second, sometimes only, uh, or in the case of neutron star mergers for a bit longer, but then those gravitational waves move on uh, and the event in the detector is over. All right, so what is then the next big step, the next, next big milestone in the field of uh, gravitational wave physics? Well, this will be um, the conclusive detection of a stochastic gravitational wave background. Uh, a gravitational wave background uh, would be a signal that uh, does not only spend a fraction of a second in the detector, but which reaches us continuously at all times and also from all directions uh, in the sky. Uh, and here I want to put the emphasis on uh, detection because, um, well, precisely speaking, uh, we're not there yet. Uh, we don't have a five sigma detection of a gravitational wave background, uh, not yet. Um, uh, which is why uh, I put here an X in, in the year of this detection. Um, I'm confident and I, I say that this can still happen uh, in this decade. All right. Um, but uh, we are pretty close to um, this point already because, as you've heard, and this is also well part of the reason for this talk here, there have now been uh, big news and big um, updates uh, in the search for a gravitational wave background uh, signal. Um, on June 29th, so just a couple of week, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, compelling evidence has been reported uh, for a gravitational wave uh, background by several PTA teams, uh, including Nanograph, uh, and then that's what, I got, what I'm going to talk about uh, today. All right, so I think um, it's important to still make this distinction at the moment. Uh, we should not yet refer to this as a detection. We have not yet reached the five sigma threshold, but we see very compelling uh, evidence. Um, and, well, uh, we can definitely conclude that everything is moving into the direct, right direction, and we are very confident uh, that we'll reach this five sigma detection at some point in the not too distant future. All right, um, so why is it exciting to uh, search and then eventually find a gravitational wave uh, background? Well, such a background would be more or less the uh, equivalent of the, 20, uh, the 21st century equivalent of another background that we know in cosmology, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background. So all of you um, have seen this picture here. Um, this is the uh, CMB, the cosmic microwave background, uh, the baby picture, uh, the baby picture of the universe, um, the afterglow of the Big Bang uh, that has been discovered um, in the 60s uh, of the large, uh, sorry, in the 60s of the last uh, century, uh, and is of course a treasure trove for cosmology. It contains a wealth of cosmological information about the state of the universe um, at very early times, roughly 380,000 years after uh, the Big Bang. All right, and now in the 21st century, uh, we can hope to add uh, another background um, from um, radiation in the universe uh, to, well, the CMB. This would be the gravitational wave background. Uh, and here, of course, uh, this is simulated data. 
um, these would be anisotropies uh, in the gravitational wave background. We have not yet seen those, uh, but of course, uh, theorists like those people here, they uh, speculate or already about how anisotropies in the gravitational wave background are expected uh, to look like. Now, uh, in the case of the CMB, we have a um, precise physical understanding. We know uh, what the CMB is composed of. The CMB uh, is relic photons uh, from the uh, universe. Uh, these are photons that undergo uh, one last scattering uh, with the thermoplasma, one last Thomson scattering uh, with electrons uh, before they then start to propagate uh, freely for 13.8 billion years uh, and before they then reach um, our um, detectors, our telescopes and satellites. Uh, all right, uh, in the case of the gravitational wave uh, background, um, well, there are at least two main options uh, on the table. Um, so just as in the case of the CMB, it might be a relic signal uh, from the early universe. So if you wish, you could uh, refer to this as relic gravitons, or let's rather say relic gravitational waves, uh, primordial gravitational waves uh, from the early universe. And uh, later, I mean, in this talk, I will discuss a couple of uh, possibilities for what kind of physics uh, in the very early universe could generate such primordial uh, gravitational waves. But in the case of the GWB, the gravitational wave background, there's certainly another very important uh, option, and this is that the signal is of astrophysical uh, origin. Uh, we'll also talk about this possibility. And in fact, um, well, this definitely is a viable possibility and maybe even the more probable, the more likely um, scenario. Astrophysical here means that the gravitational wave background originates from the superposition of many astrophysical signals from in-spiraling supermassive black holes, binary, uh, supermassive black hole binaries at the centers of galaxies. All right, but we'll talk about these two possibilities uh, and how they compare to each other um, in the next uh, hour or so. All right, um, well, there's not only um, one gravitational wave background and one specific frequency that we can try to find. In fact, uh, there's this whole uh, treasure map uh, for the gravitational wave background that awaits to be uh, explored. Uh, so this is a typical um, plot of the gravitational um, gravitational wave energy density uh, spectrum as a function of frequency, ome omega gravitational wave as a function of gravitational wave uh, frequency. Um, and we can try to find treasures, uh, signals of the gravitational wave background across this entire spectrum um, at uh, very at, at frequencies ranging from yeah these very low frequencies uh, uh, which are oscillations with a period of the order of the age of the universe all the way up uh, to very high frequencies um, and of course the hope is that in the 21st century now we will uh, find many of those treasures uh, at different frequencies now why is this possible well um, there are all these possible gravitational wave background signals across this vast frequency range, because there's a whole range of possible sources uh, for such signals. So again, um, galactic and extra galactic astrophysics uh, can give rise to a gravitational wave uh, background, uh, in particular, um, yeah, merger events across the entire observable universe, binary black hole mergers and so on. Uh, and at lower frequencies also um, in spiraling supermassive black hole binaries. And there's this whole range of um, new physics scenarios, particle physics, new particle physics uh, in the early universe that can generate a gravitational wave background at, um, well, a whole range of different uh, frequencies. And because there are so many possible signals uh, to look for, it's also important to really make use of a whole arsenal, a large arsenal of gravitational wave uh, observations and experiments um, to explore this entire chart, the entire treasure map, and try to map out the gravitational wave background as a function of frequency um, as precisely as possible. Well, and in, uh, this arsenal of techniques ranges from observations of the CMB. Uh, here at very low frequencies, we can, uh, for instance, study the um, polarization of the CMB and try to find evidence for uh, B modes and then um, primordial uh, gravitational waves. We can try to measure the tensor to scalar ratio, for instance, um, uh, in, 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 in the CMB data. Uh, and then at uh, those intermediate frequencies here in this plot, so these are still rather low frequencies at nanohertz of frequencies, uh, we can um, try to, I mean, we can use pulsar timing arrays, PTAs, uh, to search for gravitational waves. And at higher frequencies, 
Um, we can search for a gravitational wave background using interferometers. These can be interferometers uh, in space, like um, the LISA satellites that are going to be launched in the next decade, or ground-based uh, interferometers here in the uh, audio band, uh, frequencies between 10 hertz and a kilohertz or something like this. Uh, ground-based interferometers like LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra. Uh, here on the slide, you see that I printed particle physics in the early universe and PTAs uh, in bold, uh, bold text. Uh, that means this is exactly what I'm going to focus on here in, in this talk. So basically, um, the search for new particle physics in the early universe um, using PTAs and the search for nanohertz gravitational waves. All right, so let's talk a bit more about uh, PTAs. But before we can do that, I have to introduce uh, pulses. So um, I guess as many or all of you know, pulses are highly magnetized and fast spinning uh, neutron stars. They represent extremely stable systems because of um, the large um, rotation uh, frequency and, and the large angular momentum, uh, which means that they represent very precise, ultra precise stellar clocks uh, in, in the sky. And we can use them for timing measurements uh, and then set up a gravitational wave um, experiment. Well, the point is that um, pulses emit electromagnetic radiation, um, often dominated by radio um, emission, uh, electromagnetic radi radiation along the ma magnetic dipole axis. Yeah, So we've got um, the radiation coming here out of the magnetic um, north pole or magnetic and, and magnetic south pole. Uh, and this magnetic dipole axis is typically and not necessarily um, aligned with the axis of rotation of such a pulsar. Uh, which means that we don't see the pulsar at all times. We only see it when um, this magnetic dipole axis and the radiation is aligned with our line of sight. So that means that it has to point into our direction. Um, then we can see it, but then the pulsar keeps uh, spinning. Um, the cone in which the, into which the radiation is emitted uh, no longer hits us. And we have to wait for one more pulsar rotation until we see it again. So uh, this turns pulsars into cosmic lighthouses. And we see this sequence um, of uh, radio pulses every uh, couple of uh, milliseconds um, in many cases coming from uh, the pulses. And this sequence of radio pulses is extremely stable um, over um, long periods of times, so, um, years, decades, and, and uh, even much longer. And in particular for PTAs, we're interested in the fastest spinning uh, pulsars. Yeah, so in principle, pulsars can have a rotation period uh, between, yeah, let's say, a few milliseconds and up to a few seconds, um, and they can obtain those very fast uh, rotation speeds if they um, are part of a binary system, a closed binary. So they have a companion, um, and uh, they accrete material from the companion, uh, which spins them up and gives them uh, this large uh, rotation frequency, all right? And this can lead to then uh, extremely short rotation periods of the order of uh, milliseconds. These, this is the class of uh, millisecond uh, pulses. These are the most uh, stable uh, systems, uh, which provide us with the, uh, which, allow us, which, uh, which allow us to perform the most precise uh, timing measurements, all right? So in PTAs, uh, we typically use uh, millisecond pulses. All right, um, so, um, then the basic idea of the PTA is, is to not only observe one pulsar, but to look at an entire network, an entire array of pulses um, across uh, the Milky Way, uh, and th thus construct a gravitational wave detector of truly galactic uh, dimensions. Um, the pulsars are not the pulses that we use in the PTA are not uh, across the entire Milky Way, so it's not really as big as the entire galaxy, uh, but the distances are of the order of um, a few kiloparsec, so it definitely spans across our uh, galactic neighborhood here in the Milky Way. Um, now, the idea is to um, monitor those pulses over long periods of time and record those sequences of uh, radio pulses, uh, and then look for tiny, tiny distortions uh, in the pulse um, arrival times in our radio uh, telescopes, which can be caused by nanohertz uh, gravitational waves. So imagine there is a gravitational wave or an entire gravitational wave uh, background uh, propagating through uh, the Milky Way. This is also sort of, um, yeah, <laughs> this is an attempt to illustrate this here in this picture. Um, those gravitational waves, they will stretch 
and squeeze uh, spatial distances, including the spatial distances between um, our radio telescopes on Earth and the pulsars in the PTA. And then if because of those gravitational waves, because of the gravitational wave background, um, the distance between a pulsar and the Earth gets a bit shorter, um, the pulse travel time is a bit uh, shorter and the pulse may arrive a bit earlier in our radio telescopes. If the distances get stretched a bit, um, then the travel times can be and they will be longer um, and there is a delay, there is um, a delay in the time of arrival of that radio pulse. Okay, so what we actually want to do is, is to measure those times of arrival as precisely uh, as, as possible, and then to try to see whether we find any irregularities, any deviations from our expectation, uh, the expectation we have if there were no gravitational waves. Uh, and we can formulate uh, this expectation in terms of a timing model. Um, this is really where much of the analysis uh, goes into, um, right? Uh, for each individual pulsar, we need to develop a timing model that gives us our best possible um, estimate or prediction for when we expect each individual pulse to arrive at um, the radio telescopes. Um, those timing models need to know about um, the rotation frequency of the pulses, but also the time derivative of that frequency, um, about the binary dynamics, if the pulsar is part of uh, a binary, its proper motion in the sky, uh, relativistic effects, and uh, so on and so forth. All right, so this is um, complicated uh, and then very sophisticated, uh, but then gives us our theoretical, ex theoretical expectation for when we expect the individual pulses uh, to arrive. Then we can look at the difference uh, between, uh, let's say, um, theory and experiment, or between the uh, observational data, the, the measured times of arrival, and the predictions from the timing model. And that difference uh, is what we call the timing uh, residuals. Yeah, So any uh, differences in the times of arrival, uh, which are not accounted for by the timing model. Um, and we can record those timing residuals for each individual parser. These are well, uh, time series and the raw data of uh, the PTA uh, measurement. And we can already try to find some irregularities and maybe some patterns uh, in, in these timing residuals for individual pulses. This can be uh, indicative of uh, gravitational waves. But then to uh, really um, be able to make some conclusive statements, it's not enough to just look at uh, pulses by themselves. Um, the, hallmark signature of a gravitational wave background is contained in the cross correlation. So we have to uh, compare the time series, we have to compare the timing residuals for pairs of pulsars uh, in the entire PTA. Uh, and then only if we find a characteristic pattern in those cross correlations, uh, we can conclude that um, it must have been caused by gravitational waves and uh, we can't really imagine what else uh, may have faked such a pattern, such a signature. All right, so let's take a look uh, at that. Uh, we need to study the cross correlations uh, among timing residuals for pairs of pulses. Um, here on the left hand side, you can see again the sketch of our uh, PTA. Uh, Earth and the radio telescopes on Earth are right in the center. And then we've got all the different uh, pulses here in our galactic uh, neighborhood. And we can try to, or we, we can measure um, the correlation strength um, for. Um, yeah, uh, pairs of pulses. And if, uh, well, there's some other reason for the timing residuals, maybe different types of uh, noise um, or pulse, yeah, in, in particular, uh, pulsar intrinsic uh, noise will not measure any cross correlation and uh, will just find uh, zero correlation strength. All right, uh, but let's see what happens if um, the timing residuals are actually caused uh, by gravitational waves. Well, in that case, we expect this correlation pattern here. Uh, this is really the holy grail of PTA searches uh, for gravitational waves. It's called the Hellings and Downs curve because it has been uh, predicted, has been worked out and predicted by Hellings and Downs uh, in the early 80s. Uh, and this basically corresponds to a quadrupole uh, pattern um, of those correlations uh, in the sky. So let me try to explain what you can see here. Um, on the horizontal axis, we have the angular separation uh, between two pulsars uh, in the PTA in, in the sky. And if you look at two pulsars, which are very close together in the sky, uh, an angle of um, close to zero, we expect a positive uh, correlation. Yeah, So 
um, maybe yeah, uh, a shift in the times of arrival in the same direction, maybe um, a delay uh, in the times of arrival for both pulses or uh, pulses arriving a bit earlier uh, for um, uh, arriving a bit earlier for those uh, two, two pulses. Okay, so a positive correlation. For pulses which are separated by roughly 90 degrees in the sky or 270 uh, degrees, uh, we expect that the correlation turns negative, okay? But then we expect it turns positive again um, here at the largest angular separations, uh, pretty much if the pulses in the sky are uh, back to back, okay? Uh, and this is a quadruple uh, correlation in the sky, uh, which we expect if the signal is caused by gravitational waves as described uh, by uh, general relativity, um, where gravitational waves are uh, tensor perturbations, all right, um, spin two perturbations um, that, that give this, this that uh, lead to a quadrupole uh, correlation pattern. All right, so this is um, the theory part. This is what we're trying to find uh, in the gravitation or in the PTA data. Uh, and now let's turn to um, the actual measurements and what has been reported uh, recently. So you heard this already in the um, introduction to the talk. And Nanograph has recently presented um, its most recent analyses based on 15 years of pulsar observations. Um, this is one figure that uh, well manages to uh, summarize basically all the all of the observations. Tells you when uh, which of the pulses has been observed by which receiver in a given radio uh, for a given radio telescope. Um, Nanograph has been using uh, three telescopes over the years, uh, mostly the Arecibo Observatory in uh, Puerto Rico, um, which is no longer operation because it had been uh, decommissioned, uh, the Green Bank uh, Telescope in West Virginia, and then also a bit more recently, um, the Very Large Array. All right, so uh, these three observatories and uh, the actual data set, the 15 year, the Nanograph 15 year data set. Um, consists of these observations of in total 68 uh, millisecond pulses, MSPs. Uh, and for the real data analysis, um, the latest suite of nanograph papers, uh, 67 of those pulses have been uh, analyzed. There's one pulse, I maybe can try to spot it here. I don't actually know where it is. But um, yeah, one of the pulses has been observed for less than three years. So that time series is a bit too short uh, and not yet included into the analysis. Can compare this to um, the previous nanograph data set, uh, which was uh, released after uh, 12.5 years of observations, and now we have 21 more pulses um, on top of uh, what had been in the nanograph 12.5 year data set. Uh, and of course, we had more uh, observing time, so now we have three more years uh, of observations. Uh, the average uh, cadence uh, was uh, roughly once per month. Yeah, so that means each of the pulses has been uh, observed roughly once per month. Uh, with at least one of those telescopes here. Okay, um, so this is the data set, and now let's take a look at uh, what can be uh, learned, what can be extracted uh, from the data set. So the big news, and uh, I told you already, is that there's now compelling evidence uh, for a gravitational wave uh, background. Uh, that means that if we want to explain the PTA data, the uh, timing residuals for the individual pulses, it's not enough to just uh, work with uh, different sources of noise, pulsar, intrinsic uh, red noise, uh, we have to add um, a new process, uh, a new common spectral uh, process uh, for all the pulses to explain um, the uh, time series and the timing uh, residuals. So this is a new process that has the same spectral characteristics um, for all the pulses. Um, and as we'll see in a minute, it also has the right uh, cross correlations among pairs of pulses. So, um, in fact, it is, uh, in fact, it is uh, consistent, or it, it shows uh, the Hellings and Downs correlations that we would expect for a gravitational wave background with a certain level of uh, statistical significance, as I will show to you. All right, but let's have a first. Uh, let's have a look first at the spectral uh, characteristics. This is what you can see here in the plot on the uh, left-hand side. All right. Um, and you can see sort of the uh, power uh, in that new process as a function um, uh, of a frequency. Uh, and we measure the largest amplitude here at uh, very low frequencies. All right. So this is 
um, a frequency of the order of one over um, yeah 15 to 10 years and you see that um, this corresponds to what we call an excess timing delay of the order of um, almost a microsecond uh, maybe this is around uh, 300 um, nanoseconds okay so what does this actually uh, mean um, that means that um, over periods of um, uh, yeah periods of time of 10 to 15 years uh, there are extra contributions to the times of arrival for the individual pulses uh, individual pulses uh, of the order of uh, 300 uh, nanoseconds so sometimes um, those pulses arrive um, a bit earlier by up to 300 nanoseconds or a bit later by up to 300 nanoseconds uh, you can also think about this in the following way so uh, within 300 uh, nanoseconds uh, light roughly uh, travels 100 uh, meters Okay, um, so you can think about this uh, in, in the sense that, well, the position of the entire solar system, the entire solar system wobbles around um, because of the gravitational wave uh, background, and the distance between the center of the solar system and pulses, pulses in the PTA, they are stretched and squeezed um, by something of the order of 100 uh, meters. Um, uh, over periods of 10 uh, to 15 years yeah so um within that time maybe the distance between the center of the solar system and uh, a pulse over there gets uh, shorter by 100 meters and it gets longer by 100 meters uh, in comparison uh, with respect to a pulse in that direction and then a couple of years later um the distance becomes um shorter uh, the distance to another pulse in another direction becomes shorter by 100 meters and so on and so forth. So uh, basically, uh, the entire uh, solar system, the position of the solar system is wobbling around um, by um, something of this order of magnitude uh, over well, these long periods of time. And then if you look at what happens at um, shorter times, then you can see, okay, uh, there are well, extra contributions to uh, the timing residuals um, uh, which are a bit smaller uh, so then you have corrections of the order of maybe just um, uh, 10 nanoseconds or um, yeah not 100 meters uh, if you think about it this way uh, but of the order of uh, 30 meters 10 meters uh, and so on all right um uh, so question the... uh question yes. is okay uh, yes please, so in your uh, left graph huh. uh so is a kind of sensitivity of the nanograph uh based mm -hmm. on the p uh PTA. Mm -hmm. So well, why uh, the PTA is intrinsically uh, most sensitive to the uh, nanohertz? Uh, right, yes, yeah. So um, the frequency window that we have access to, or the frequency band, is determined by the time scales uh, in the measurement, in the observation. So we have access to um, the lowest frequencies uh, which are given by one over the uh, observing time so if we observe for 15 years uh, we can go down to frequencies uh, which correspond to one over 15 years if we keep observing for 30 years we can go down to frequencies as low as one over um 30 years and so uh, that the... may keep yeah that may give some kind of lower bound of the frequency but the uh, can there be some higher frequency bound also? Yes, yes, yeah, very good. Yeah, so uh, there, there is a similar answer to uh, the maximum frequency. Uh, this is given by what I call what we call the cadence uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the observations. So if we observe every pulsar, let's say um, once per month, um, then the highest frequency that we have access to is one over one month. Uh, if we observe uh -huh. the pulses every week, then we have a higher cadence and the highest frequency that we have access to would be one over one week. Um, so this is the whole frequency band that we have access to. But uh, it's also important to note that um, the further we go, the, the higher we go up here in, in frequency, um, yeah, uh, the more we are affected also by different types of noise. So here at those high frequencies, um, we start to suffer from white noise uh, contributions uh, to, to the data. So that's why uh, it will be difficult uh, to find uh, a signal here in this noise background at very high frequencies. 
Um, this is not the case at those lower frequencies, uh, which is why uh, we can measure the signal here um, with the with the highest significance at, at the lowest frequencies. Okay, thank you. Yep, yeah, you're welcome. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and of course, I mean, another important point is that uh, we want to observe for as long as possible to uh, have access to those uh, very low frequencies. Um, and well, uh, I should also say that um, the effect of the gravitational wave on one individual pulse from a pulsar is, is tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, and this will not be measurable um, by, by any experiment. So basically what we see here is an integrated uh, effect. We can integrate uh, over those um, uh, contributions to the timing residuals coming from the gravitational wave uh, background over um, a time period that is basically as long as possible. And then if we integrate over 10 years, uh, 12 years, uh, 15 years, uh, the effect can build up and integrate to such a size that becomes measurable uh, in, in our experiments. And only then if we really uh, wait for 10, 15 years, uh, we can see how um, a contribution to the timing residuals can build up and then reach something of the order of, uh, as I said here, 300 uh, nanoseconds. This is still tiny, um, but um, a deviation by 300 nanoseconds is something uh, we can measure um, even over a period of 10, 15 years. Uh, but uh, if there was no such integration uh, over a long observing time, the effect would be even much, much uh, smaller and would be beyond any possibility uh, to actually measure it. Yeah, So we have to do this integration um, over um, um, the extra contribution to the timing residuals from the gravitational wave background. And only if it has built up over a sufficiently long time, 10 years, 15 years, it becomes large enough so that we can actually uh, see it in the data. All right. So one, um, more, one more question mm -hmm. uh, related to the uh, next, uh, the left-hand side graph. Mm -hmm. So about the uh, dotted line and the blue line, uh, that's the uh, uh, kind of power, uh, power or low amplitude. So mm -hmm, is it mm -hmm. based on, the, on some theoretical model on the gravitational wave sources or uh, so yes. independent of the model? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, this, this is an excellent question and um, I will talk more about this now in the rest of the talk. Um, so, I mean, first of all, and this is exactly the next comment I wanted to make, uh, we can take the data here, um, and I mean, the um, um, the the common spectrum process, uh, and then try to describe its spectral characteristics by a power law. So this would then be a simple power law fit, uh, characterized in terms of two parameters, an amplitude and a spectral index. Uh, this brings us from the plot on the left-hand side to the plot on the right-hand side. Uh, and these are the uh, posterior distributions uh, for those two parameters, um, the spectral index gamma, and the amplitude uh, A, all right? Um, and yes, I mean, there are some theoretical expectations. For instance, the astrophysical interpretation, I will talk about this in a few minutes, in terms of in-spiraling supermassive black hole uh, binaries. Um, well, it gives you a range of predictions, but sort of a canonical value, or at least a standard reference value that has been used in the literature for a long time, would be that the astrophysical interpretation gives you a spectral index of 13 thirds. Uh, and well, this would be the power law shown here by the black uh, dashed line. So this is this is a theoretical expe expectation under some uh, assumptions. And of course, you can compare this then to uh, the data or these other uh, model predictions here. Um, you see at this level here in this comparison, the gamma value of 13 thirds doesn't do such a good job. Yeah. So we can talk about how uh, we can talk about what this actually means uh, for the uh, supermassive black hole uh, interpretation. But yeah, we'll come to it. Uh, let me maybe still say a few words on the st st statistical significance uh, of, of this measurement here. So we tried to assess this in terms of a Bayesian uh, language. Yeah, we perform a Bayesian uh, model comparison where we can um, compare models to each other in terms of uh, a base factor. And let me just quote a couple of numbers before we move on. Um, in this Bayesian model comparison, we consider several possibilities. Let me just highlight uh, some of them here. So the simplest model would be just intrinsic uh, pulsar noise. So actually there is no new signal uh, in, in the data. Uh, this is kind of a null hypothesis, all right? Um, then the second possibility is what we call current uh, common spectrum, spatially uncorrelated uh, red noise. So this is a new process um, that looks like this here um, as, as a function of frequency. So there is 
some new process uh, that needs to be added to the timing uh, models so to explain the timing residuals has the same spectral characteristics for all the pulses uh, but this model does not yet have the right headings and downs uh, correlations and the third model is uh, what would really describe a gravitational wave background yeah so this is um, a new um, component uh, in the timing model a common spectrum process the same for all pulses but with the right angular correlations uh, in the sky and now in this model Bayesian uh, in this Bayesian model comparison we can work out uh, the base factors so these are these uh, model like the ratios of model likelihoods uh, basically and we can see that the base factor for uh, current versus um, intrinsic pulsar noise only is huge yeah so this ratio of uh, probabilities here is uh, yeah uh, 10 to the 12 so there's some overwhelming uh, evidence uh, for the presence of this um, new type of uh, signal there definitely is something new in the data all right uh, and then we can ask does it have the right correlations angular uh, correlations uh, in the sky and for this we look at the second base factor here which could compares um, sort of this model including the right cross correlations versus um, yeah a similar model but without uh, the right cross correlations and here we find the base factor um of the order of 200 up to a thousand so again uh a rather i mean pretty large uh, base factor so we'll conclude we can conclude here that we can conclude that there is a uh, decisive decisive evidence for a new common spectrum process okay there's basically no doubt about that and there is compelling evidence and this is what i said on my very first slide there's compelling evidence for the right type of cross correlations namely the headings and downs uh, correlations and this range here depends on well some choices in um, our analysis for instance the number of frequency bins uh, taken into account uh, but no matter how you set up the analysis you will always find um, a very large base factor uh, of the order of 200 uh, at least or larger okay so this is the Bayesian language uh, of course um, uh, people also want to know um, this in the frequentist language and maybe uh, uh, here a sigma value we'll come to this uh, in, in a minute let me first of all um, show you um, the evidence that we have uh, for the right type of uh, cross correlations the headings and downs uh, correlations uh, we can do this um, in two different ways we perform uh, a Bayesian uh, analysis um, and we can reconstruct basically um, the power here in the cross correlation among pairs of pulses uh, in terms of um yeah um cubic splines uh, at seven different um possible separations so at seven uh, different nodes uh, and these are Bayesian posterior uh, probability densities for the cross correlation um, at these uh, seven points okay uh, we can also do the same in terms of a frequentist uh, language and then basically measure um, the strength of the cross correlation based on what we call the optimal uh, statistic uh, we can we can talk about uh, more details later um, but what happens here basically is sort of a matched filtering uh, approach um, where we try to choose an optimal filter uh, in the data analysis and then uh, extract the amplitude of the cross correlations um, uh, from from the PTA data all right uh, you can see both plots um, from the Bayesian analysis and the frequentist analysis are, are consistent um, and now we can try to well, use that and assess the statistical significance uh, of our uh, observation so our frequentist friends want to know how many sigma uh, do these uh, observations uh, correspond to all right uh, and for this we can set up um, a p-value test for two different uh, test statistics um, the first test statistic would be uh, the base factor that I just showed to you so let's go back here I told you we find a base factor of the order of um, 200 up to a thousand uh, we can ask how likely is it uh, to observe such a large base factor under the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis would be um, that there actually are no uh, cross correlations uh, in the data and then the large base factor is um, just a result of uh, random fluctuations uh, the second test statistic we can use is uh, the signal to noise ratio for the optimal uh, statistic this is related to the frequentist analysis I just uh, showed to you all right uh, and we can yeah construct the uh, distribution of those two st test statistics under the null hypothesis which again is the hypothesis that there are actually no um, correlations no headings and downs correlations uh, in the data 
we can construct such a null distribution uh, in, in two different ways. Um, so um, the first one would be uh, phase shifts, and this is what you can see here in, in these two plots. Basically, you take the time series for the individual uh, passes and you introduce random uh, shifts in those um, time series, uh, which means that you break all the correlations uh, in the data set, uh, spatial correlations in the sky, but also temporal uh, correlations. Uh, because you just shift um, yeah, um, the, the timing measurements uh, to different points. Uh, and what had been maybe correlated previously is then no longer uh, correlated. A second possibility is to do what we call sky uh, scrambles. So this will break uh, angular correlations, uh, will not break uh, temporal uh, correlations. But you can imagine you take the pulses uh, in the sky, you just imagine that they now move to different uh, positions. You just basically scramble around uh, the position in the sky and then also um, basically completely um, lose the information about the angular separation between pulses in the sky. Uh, this will also remove um, yeah, angular correlations uh, from the data. Um, again, so here in these two plots, you see the null distributions of those test statistics uh, after performing those uh, phase shifts. Okay, uh, and then basically after a phase shift, you can again calculate the base factor here on the left hand side, or after a phase shift, you can calculate the signal to noise ratio um, for the optimal statistic um, on the right hand side. And then you get these null distributions, and you can see that the measured value that we find. Uh, which is here, this value between 200 and, and 1,000, basically is in the three sigma tail um, of the null distribution. And in the frequentist analysis, uh, we find, um, well, um, in the even larger uh, sigma value here, the measured value of the signal to noise ratio is somewhere um, right uh, in the three to four sigma tail uh, of the distribution. So we find that this null hypothesis, no correlations, no Hellings and Nulls correlations, is rejected at the three to four sigma level. Uh, and this is now the statistical significance uh, in which we can uh, make this claim and say uh, that the null hypothesis is rejected. There must be Hellings and Downs correlations uh, in the data. So we find this compelling evidence for Hellings and Downs uh, correlations. Um, that's amazing. Uh, and this is on top of the uh, overwhelmingly large, uh, the huge evidence for the whole single, um, for the single as a whole. Um, in, in the sense of a common spectrum uh, process. So again, this was this huge base uh, factor here. Um, so this is almost undeniable. And on top of this, uh, we find the competing evidence for headings and downs correlations. Okay, very good. So this is the data. And now let's turn to different interpretations. I mentioned this already before. Uh, the astrophysical interpretation is uh, to say that we have a whole distribution, a whole ensemble of in-spiraling supermassive black hole binaries across the observable universe. Each of them emits gravitational waves at a characteristic uh, frequency, but then these gravitational waves, they overlap, um, and the superposition is a stochastic gravitational wave background. We know that most galaxies host, uh, haha, there is, one B, uh, too much here. So I should say most galaxy host a supermassive black hole uh, at the center, just one, like our Milky Way uh, has one supermassive black hole at the center. Uh, and then uh, binaries of such uh, supermassive black holes form after galaxy merges. Yeah, So two galaxies merge, and if both galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center, um, then the galaxy merger will also lead to uh, a binary of supermassive black holes. Uh, a few of such binaries are known. Uh, we, we have observational um, proof, evidence and proof of uh, binaries of supermassive black holes. Uh, but so far, no uh, merger of such a binary has been uh, observed. All the binaries that we know, uh, for instance, from yeah, uh, satellite and telescope observations, are still too far separated. They are at separations of maybe of the order of a kiloparsec. Uh, but then the uh, gravitational wave emission only takes over um, at much later times uh, when the binaries are much, uh, when the black holes are much closer uh, together uh, of the order of something less than a parsec. Yeah? And then, right, uh, the system first has to evolve from large separations, um, kiloparsec, down to something below uh, the parsec scale. Um, there's still lots of open questions um, in the field of how this can happen, how this works. Uh, but definitely there's uh, this hope um, that uh, the PTA observations will now shed more light 
on um, galaxy evolution and also the evolution of those uh, binaries, the supermassive black hole binaries, uh, and tell us uh, on which time scales um, binaries uh, in spiral and merge, uh, and maybe also give us some clues as to how they reach these very close separations in the first place. All right. Um, well, now we can compare um, our expectation for the signal from supermassive black hole binaries uh, to um, the data, um, the most recent nanograph uh, data. Uh, and this is what you can see here in this plot. This is in the language of A and gamma, the two parameters of the power law fit, the spectral index uh, and the amplitude. Uh, we compare the observed spectrum, uh, NG15, uh, in green to the theoretical expectation from um, numerical simulations. This has been uh, done using uh, nanograph's holodeck uh, software. Yeah, the theoretical expectation for supermassive black hole binaries, uh, which is shown here uh, in, in blue. All right. So on the theory side, you can make a lot of different assumptions. Um, you can um, be very flexible. You can be more constraining. Uh, and depending on how you do that, you can uh, well, basically get predictions here across larger or smaller parts of, of this parameter space. Um, here, this is one particular choice, but which is um, reasonable. So this theoretical expectation here assumes supermassive black hole binaries uh, on circular orbits. Uh, eccentric orbits will not do much uh, to the shape of those predictions here. Um, and it assumes that the evolution, the orbital evolution of those binaries is purely driven uh, by uh, gravitational wave emission. This is a stronger assumption. And if you loosen this assumption, you may be also able to, I mean, we know you're able to get um, broader predictions here in, in this parameter space. Um, but yeah, uh, this assumption here, uh, purely gravitational wave uh, driven orbital evolution, uh, has been sort of a reference or standard assumption in the literature um, over um, yeah, many years, and uh, we can use it here to illustrate that there is some tension uh, between uh, the theoretical prediction and the observational data. So here, this level in this representation, we see that the ninety-five percent regions uh, barely touch. Yeah? I mean, they they just touch here at this one point here, um, which means that under these assumptions that go into this plot, um, there is sort of a mild tension uh, between. Uh, theory and observation, something of the order of uh, two sigma. Uh, but as I said before, this tension can be reduced in more phenomenological models that also take into account uh, the interaction of the binaries uh, with their immediate uh, environment and, eff and effects like um, uh, dynamical friction uh, together with the uh, with the with the gas environment. All right. Um, in any case, the Supermassive black hole binary interpretation tells us that, um, well, our very naive, the most naive expectation does not work uh, very well. Uh, we sort of have to go to unexpected corners uh, of the parameter space. Maybe there's nothing wrong with it, uh, and you can still make this interpretation work and eventually make it work uh, very well. Uh, but from the astrophysical perspective, there's definitely some kind of slight surprise here. Um, <laughs> contained in the data. So comparing to earlier expectations, we would conclude the signal strength is a bit larger. The signal is a bit stronger than previously and naively expected. Uh, and we also see that the spectral tilt uh, is, I mean, in these units here, it's a bit smaller uh, than previously and naively uh, expected. All right. Um, so it's not spot on. It's not like that you uh, uh, basically uh, do um, um, blinded analysis, and then you unblind, and it's uh, just right on top of each other. Uh, that's not what we see here. Uh, and then this gives rise to another interesting uh, possibility, which has attracted a lot of attention. And this is the possibility that um, the signal we see in nanograph actually also contains uh, or is composed of gravitational waves uh, from the Big Bang. So it is definitely a viable possibility at the moment, moment that the signal receives uh, contributions from astrophysical systems, supermassive black hole binaries, plus a secondary contribution. Or you can take this, uh, you can make an even more extreme assumption. You can assume that uh, you can think about the possibility that the signal uh, is of exotic origin only, uh, and the signal from supermassive black holes is still slightly suppressed and has not yet shown up in the data. Uh, so following this idea here, um, 
this would mean that we can use the PTA data to probe the cosmology of the primordial universe uh, at very early times when those gravitational waves are produced, uh, at times even much, much earlier um, than the CMB uh, emission. Maybe we can probe the first fractions of a second uh, after the Big Bang. And because we can go um, so far back in time, it also means that we uh, have access or we get access to uh, particle physics at extremely high energies and extremely high temperatures, much above the electric scale, for instance, and also then uh, then high energies that um, are not within the reach of collider experiments uh, on Earth, uh, for instance. And this allows the um, this would open up a possibility to search for truly new physics, particle physics beyond the standard model uh, in the PTA data. All right. Before I show you some results, let me just briefly tell you um, about uh, who has been involved in this analysis. So this is our nanograph uh, team that has been working uh, on um, well these uh, searches. Uh, it has been a small team in a in a big uh, collaboration. Um, you see there are well um, several members of my group here and in Münster. So everybody with a star, uh, Richard and Raphael and Tobias and myself are from Münster. So this is the local Münster group. Um, and then, then there are um, in total three full members in the team. This is Andrea, Ken, uh, and, and myself. Um, uh, Andrea is at Daisy in Hamburg uh, and everybody else is in, in the US. All right. Uh, and then for the most recent nanograph results, we contributed uh, this paper here, the search for new signals from new physics. And to carry out this analysis, we also developed a new software tool uh, that allows us to fit uh, BSM models to PTA data. Uh, we call this PTA uh, PT Arcade. Um, I will show a slide uh, at the very end, and then um, yeah, you can check it out if you're interested. All right. So um, this is our contribution to the analysis of the Nanograph uh, 15 uh, year data. Um, Basically, this paper here has been written uh, mostly in, in Münster and in Hamburg, uh, has attracted a lot of attention um, in the community uh, Yeah, um, in, in the first couple of weeks. And I just would like to highlight and uh, yeah, give a shout out to everybody involved in the project who has been doing an amazing job. Um, the project has been led by uh, Andrea and myself. Uh, and then we split the work in the sense that uh, different team members were responsible for different sub analyses. So my student Richard was responsible for cosmological phase transitions. Uh, Raphael uh, was responsible for the um, search for mm, for the models of inflation and scale induced gravitational waves, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I will skip this slide slide here and now um, just list possible BSM options um, scenarios of physics beyond the standard model that can give rise to a gravitational wave uh, background from the early universe. So uh, one sort of standard scenario or a typical scenario is cosmic uh, inflation, uh, which can lead to the uh, amplification of uh, primordial tensor perturbations. Uh, the simplest models of inflation uh, will not give you an observable gravitational wave signal at nanohertz uh, frequencies. Uh, for this, the amplitude will just be uh, suppressed. Uh, but if the primordial tensor spectrum is strongly blue tilted, uh, it can actually rise uh, to a sufficiently large amplitude at nanohertz uh, frequencies. So non-minimal blue tilted models of inflation might give you an observable signal. And in this case, you would have some nice complementarity, some nice interplay uh, between uh, the PDA observations um, and uh, CMB observables. Another possibility is a phase transition in the early universe, uh, change in the vacuum structure. Uh, this can be either um, sort of in the standard model, including some modifications. So it can be a modified version of the QCD phase transition, uh, something that turns the QCD phase transition into a first order phase transition. Or it can be something in a um, sector that's dark, a dark sector altogether, uh, including new degrees of freedom that give rise to a strong first order phase transition. Uh, and that would be complementary to laboratory searches for such new degrees of freedom, or maybe new degrees of freedom that help to turn the QCD phase transition into a first order phase transition. Well, phase transitions in the early universe can give rise to gravitational waves, but they can also leave behind cosmic uh, defects, um, which are then themselves responsible for the emission of gravitational waves. And this is actually predicted in many thinner scenarios of um, grand unification. So here there's a nice complementarity between gut physics 
uh, and those PDA searches for gravitational waves. Many gut models actually um, mm, predict that stages of spontaneous symmetry breaking in the early universe um, give rise to cosmic defects such as uh, cosmic strings or domain walls, and each of those objects can emit gravitational waves. Uh, and, and then finally, there's the possibility that gravitational waves originate at second order uh, in perturbation theory. So if there's a mechanism in the uh, universe, maybe inflation, that can strongly enhance, that can strongly enhance scalar perturbations, um, those scalar perturbations can source gravitational waves again uh, at second order in perturbation theory. Um, and the scalar perturbations, these are just um, large density perturbations, they can collapse uh, into primordial black holes. And now there's this nice complementarity between uh, the physics of primordial black holes, uh, PBHs, and, and our nanograph and our PDA searches for um, nanohertz gravitational waves. And the PBHs, the primordial black holes originating from such scenarios, they can contribute to a dark matter, at least a fraction of, of dark matter, or they can be the seeds of supermassive black holes that can uh, contribute to the uh, binary black hole events seen at uh, ground based interferometers. So, yeah, there's um, this whole range of possibilities and the nice interplay between uh, PBH physics um, and, and gravitational waves at low frequencies. Um, so, yes, I think I should uh, try to conclude sometime soon, uh, uh, but I would still like to show, yeah. Um, at least uh, those results here, and then we can 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 skip a couple of slides. Uh, what we do in the analysis is we consider all these scenarios um, and perform um, a whole Bayesian inference inference uh, analysis. We uh, construct uh, the Bayesian posterior uh, constraints on the parameters, and we calculate base factors uh, comparing our new physics scenarios to um, sort of a baseline reference model, uh, which just assumes uh, supermassive black holes only. And so now our null hypothesis or the reference model is supermassive black hole binaries uh, only. And we can see how any of those new physics models uh, compares to that, um, to that model. Uh, you can see a summary here in this plot. Um, the blue points are the base factors I just mentioned, uh, and the red points uh, the comparison, the Bayesian model, Bayesian model comparison for hybrid models uh, compared against uh, this reference model. So hybrid means uh, I have two contributions to the gravitational wave uh, background. This would be new physics plus supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, both contribute uh, to the gravitational wave background. And we can ask, how does this um, compare to black holes only? Um, and well, what we find here is rather interesting. Um, you see the different models. Uh, this one is inflation. Uh, this is scale-induced gravitational waves, scale-induced gravitational waves, and so on. Phase transitions, different types of phase transitions, stable cosmic strings, metastable cosmic strings, super strings uh, from string theory, and different types of uh, domain walls. And we find that many of these BSM models reach large base factors of the order of 10 to 100. So it looks like that they give, I mean, it's clear they give a good fit uh, of the data. Um, this is interesting, but it's also not conclusive at, at the moment because there are lots of uncertainties in the analysis uh, on both sides um, in the modeling of the supermassive black hole binaries, uh, in particular in, um, well, really defining um, the right priors on things like the amplitude and the spectral index coming from, uh, for, for the gravitational wave signal from supermassive black hole binaries. And there are also uncertainties on the new physics side, um, where sometimes uh, the theoretical modeling of the signal um, is still very rudimentary um, and then requires more work and things like that. So um, this is again, this is interesting but not conclusive. Uh, we should also I should also point out that the base factors are sensitive to prior choices. Um, so uh, you should not take this here at, at face value. Uh, and the bottom line still is that um, well. It's interesting. Uh, it's clear that the stable cosmic strings uh, don't look good. Um, they don't give a good fit to the data, in particular because the gravitational wave spectrum uh, is, is a bit too flat uh, for the stable cosmic strings. Uh, but all the other BSM models allow us to fit the data. They give um, fits of, of high quality, uh, which means that they are options um, that remain on the table and that require further investigation. All right. 
Um, how much more time do I have? Uh, I think I should conclude soon, right? Maybe five more minutes? Uh, Lou, uh, uh, yeah, actually, the, uh, the, you can use the five minutes more. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, five minutes. Five minutes is, is, is fine. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, um, yeah so you just see some example spectra uh, for those new physics models. Uh, different colors correspond to inflation, gravitational waves from inflation, or phase transition, or scalar induced gravitational waves. Down here, we have different uh, spectra for stable, uh, for cosmic strings, or yeah, stable cosmic strings, metastable cosmic strings, domain walls, and so on. Um, and we see that by construction, in a sense, um, those gravitational wave spectra, they give us, in most cases, they give us a good fit of the data. Uh, and they also look similar uh, by construction, because I mean, here we have, um, well, um, marginalized those spectra uh, over the parameter space, uh, the viable parameter space, uh, which results in these median gravitational wave spectra uh, that give us the best possible um, representation or uh, approximation of, of the data. All right. Um, so to give us the best fit, they must necessarily all look very similar. Uh, which means the relevant question here rather is um, how do I obtain such a good looking spectrum, such a spectrum that gives me a good fit in a given new physics model? Yeah? So which parameter values uh, actually do predict um, gravitational wave spectra uh, of the shape of, of the right form? Uh, so we have to basically uh, well take this information here and then go back to the model parameter space and then see where can those gravitational wave spectra actually live in the model parameter space? Uh, and, and this is uh, what we do in the paper. Uh, uh, we do parameter inference uh, and go th through the whole list of models and do these uh, Bayesian um, fits of the uh, new physics models. And uh, this allows us to identify which are the viable regions in the new physics models to explain uh, the PTA data. And then we obtain, uh, well, these corner plots and the Bayesian posterior distributions uh, for inflationary gravitational waves, scale induced gravitational waves, and so on. Um, you can find all the plots in the paper. We can talk more about it um, in the discussion if you're interested. Um, but here we'd just like to show that, uh, well, we've got a complete and comprehensive um, sort of um, model analysis and discussion of the viable parameter space for all the models. All right. And from this, we can then extract uh, point values and uncertainty estimates. So in a sense, we can tell what is the best fit uh, parameter value for any of the parameters in our new phys physics models. We tabulate this uh, in long tables uh, in the paper. Uh, and then for, from this, you can then read off the best fit values. We basically tell you the best fit values of all the parameters. Uh, and then also uh, constraints at the 68% level, for instance, uh, constraints for all these parameters in the BSM models. Um, all right, so my time is almost up, so I will skip uh, these two slides. I would just like to tell you again that uh, we did the analysis using our own new code. Uh, we call this PT Arcade. Um, yeah, so this is supposed to be like an arcade. Uh, uh, where you go and play some, some video games. Uh, here you can download the code and uh, play around uh, with your favorite uh, BSM model um, and fit it to the PTA data, all right? Uh, and then get plots like those um, that tell you where in your model parameter space you're able to explain um, the data, all right? So this is the code we developed for our paper. Um, and yeah, I invite you to check it out. Uh, in conclusion, I would say there is uh, a bright future uh, for gravitational wave science uh, with uh, PTAs. Um, let me just summarize the current status. The status is that we do see uh, a common spectrum process uh, in the data that has the right type of cross-correlation, uh, helix and dance correlations at a statistical significance of uh, three to four sigma, um, if, if we uh, talk about the nanograph uh, data. Uh, the next step definitely will be to uh, find or to confirm the right correlations at the five sigma level to constrain the spectral shape uh, more precisely, uh, which will then also um, uh, allow us to say more about the uh, to or to, to con constrain um, 
different interpretations, different models, um, uh, yeah, more strongly. Uh, okay, so we want to, to measure the spectral shape uh, more precisely. And then, of course, another step in the future is to search and hopefully find uh, anisotropies uh, in the sky, as I showed you at the very beginning of the talk. At the moment, we're just looking at the sort of homogeneous uh, monopole across the entire sky. But just like in the case of the CMB uh, in the 20th century, uh, there's some hope that now in the 21st century, we can work with the GWB, the gravitational wave background, and eventually find anisotropies and contract something like an angular power spectrum uh, for the fluctuations uh, in the gravitational wave background. So the promise of the entire field is that it will lead either to deep insights into galaxy and black hole evolution and or deep insights into new physics uh, beyond the standard model. So definitely stay tuned and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk, Kai. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, is there any questions online? Okay, um, maybe I can have a question first. And then you introduce the new physics and the uh, and the uh, supermassive black hole binary. Uh, that feature, I have some question because uh, the new physics you mentioned, for example, like the cosmic stream and uh, the phase transition, that is uh, from um, that is from very early universe. But mm -hmm. for the supermassive black hole binary, what's the time of that event? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, we're talking about different moments in time. I mean. A gravitational wave background from the early universe, maybe produced by new physics, uh, has been produced in the first fraction, in the first fractions of a second after the Big Bang, and has then propagated uh, throughout the entire universe, um, yeah, for its entire lifetime for 13.8 billion years, uh, and it reaches us today, like um, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, uh, reaches us uh, today. Uh, in the case of the supermassive black hole binaries. Um, well, I mean, the gravitational wave background uh, starts being emitted uh, by inspiraling uh, binaries uh, as soon as those objects start to be around, um, so soon after the formation. Uh, but this will not be <laughs> this will not be here in this picture. This will not be in the first fractions of a second. Uh, this will be at some point after the beginning of a structure formation. Yeah, so within the first hundreds of millions of years. Um, into um, the evolution of the universe uh, when the first structures form and, and uh, the first supermassive black hole binaries start to be around. Uh, this is when you get the first contributions uh, to this background uh, signal. Um, uh, but I should also say that in this interpretation, supermassive black hole binaries, um, this, the background that uh, we observe here uh, in the Milky Way and then uh, uh, in our solar system would be uh, dominated by um, systems um, still in sort of our cosmic um, neighborhood. Um, you can talk about this in terms of um, the redshift volume, out to which redshift um, do we still get um, contributions or where do we get the most uh, contributions uh, to the gravitational wave background. And here we talk about um, uh, supermassive black hole binary systems uh, at redshifts of uh, 0.5 or redshift of one or redshift of 1.5, um, which is uh, on cosmological scales, still somewhat closer to us, uh, both in space, but also closer to us uh, in, in time. So in that sense, this background is generated uh, more recently <laughs> during the last couple of uh, last couple of billion years, uh, but not exactly 13.8 billion years ago, and then just within the first fraction of a second. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions? Uh, I yeah. have some questions. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, okay, Professor Park. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I have a uh, rather theoretical uh, question. So compared with uh, CMB, mm. uh, does gravitational wave background have a well-defined temperature? So it follows some thermal distribution. Is it such a thing known or? Do you see no, 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 no. Yeah, I mean, that, that's also a good question, um, but the answer is no. Um, I mean, 
the CMB is, is, a, is a relic from a thermal plasma that has been in uh, thermal equilibrium. If you measure the CMB as a function of um, microwave uh, frequency, it gives you a perfect uh, black body uh, spectrum. Uh, in fact, the CMB is, is, the, back, is the best black body uh, that we know. Um, and there you have a well-defined uh, temperature. And then you can talk about the fluctuations around, te around that uh, temperature. Uh, but the um, gravitational wave background has never been in thermal equilibrium. Uh, gravitational waves, or gravitons, if you wish, uh, interact uh, extremely weakly. Uh, the interactions are suppressed by uh, the Planck scale. Uh, they're not part of the um, thermal bath. Um, maybe you can think about some extreme scenarios uh, where you have, um, in sort of a theory of quantum gravity, um, extremely high temperatures, large as the Planck scale, uh, but that does not look uh, very sensible or plausible to me. Um, yeah, I mean, in in all of what I've been saying here in this talk, um, you would say that the gravitational waves uh, never establish thermal equilibrium, um, and uh, well, that's why you can't really ascribe a temperature uh, to the gravitational wave uh, background. It's rather um, yeah, the superposition of individual gravitational wave signals that uh, don't have a thermal mm, distribution, but which are just described uh, depending on the uh, production, the generation uh, mechanism. So, for instance, uh, in the case of the supermassive black hole binaries, um, the largest contribution is quadrupole radiation uh, from each uh, individual binary, all right? Um, yeah, that this is similar to uh, dipole radiation and electrodynamics, but here in general relativity, we talk about quadrupole uh, radiation from such a um, binary system uh, that has a fixed frequency, no distribution. Uh, maybe there's some overtones and things like this, but it's dominated by um, by one uh, frequency uh, in the quadrupole radiation. This is what it is emitted from one binary system, and then you have many, 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 many other binary systems each of them uh, gives you sort of quadrupole radiation at another frequency. Uh, you look at the superposition, you put everything on top of each other, and then you get a stochastic background spanning a whole frequency range. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, I have some question. The question is, uh, you mentioned some uh, new physics you wrote as a, a X in the very early universe. Mm -hmm. So, like a, a domain war or a cosmic mm -hmm. string, and uh, many other sources, it may happen in a very different uh, times in the universe. Uh, let's, let's say, in terms of redshift, it may be mm -hmm. very different redshift time. Let's say, and then by the time that we observe through PTA, uh, I guess redshift will be very important. And yes. but the question is, how come? All independent of all such sources, we can say that the frequency would be around mm -hmm. uh, nanohertz again. Yes, yeah, this this is this is an excellent question. Um and I I fully agree with everything you're saying. So if you look at gravitational wave production in the early universe, uh it will typically happen at very high frequencies. Uh, in many scenarios, the typical scale for the gravitational wave production is the Hubble rate, the expansion rate. Uh, at that time uh, of production. Um, this is, um, yeah, a high energy scale uh, in the early universe. The Hubble can be 10 to the, um, I mean, during inflation can be up to 10 to the 13 GeV, and then after inflation, uh, lower than this. So you start with gravitational waves at extremely high frequencies in the early universe. Uh, and what well, to um, find the, or they correspond to frequencies today in our observations, uh, which include the redshift factor, as you just said. So I, I fully agree uh, with the statement. Um, in some cases, uh, we can expect a gravitational wave signal from the physics across a whole range of frequencies. This works, for instance, uh, for cosmic strings. Cosmic strings uh, organize themselves in sort of a network in the early universe. And this network enters a so-called scaling regime. Uh, this is a regime or evolution um, that is self-similar. Uh, certain quantities just remain constant uh, over time or have some very simple scaling uh, relations. So the network is around for a long time in the early universe, uh, evolves in a self-similar fashion, and keeps emitting gravitational waves all the time, which means that 
from the very early evolution of the network, you get gravitational waves at high frequencies, but then later gravitational waves at lower frequencies, lower frequencies, lower frequencies. Uh, you basically have a spectrum that goes across um, the whole frequency uh, range. And there it's maybe, mm, yeah, um, not too surprising that you can also see something at PTA frequencies. Uh, in other cases, it corresponds to a specific uh, parameter choice. So in the case of a cosmological phase transition, it does not always work. Um, and here, to get the right frequencies, and this is your question, uh, to get the right frequencies, the phase transition has to occur at the right time um, or the right temperature. If you have a phase transition that happens at the electroweak scale and the temperatures of the order of 100 uh, GeV, or maybe a bit above that, uh, temperatures 1 TeV, you will never see a signal at PTA frequencies. Then you will see a signal maybe at uh, millihertz of frequencies, which is more relevant for the LISA uh, space-based um, gravitational wave interferometer. Uh, to get something at PTA frequencies, you have to have a phase transition at lower temperatures. And uh, so here I can actually show our results. Um, yeah, this, this is a nice one. Um, this is for a phase transition signal. A T star is the transition temperature. Uh, look at this 1D distribution here, uh, and we find that the temperature needs to be of the order of 100 MeV. Um, this is where you get gravitational waves at just the right uh, frequencies, including the redshift effect that you described. Um, and we single out a temperature scale. And this temperature scale, 100 MeV, uh, is, is very interesting because uh, it's close to the confinement scale in uh, QCD. And that's why I said that, sorry, uh, we're jumping back and forth. That's why I said that if you talk about a phase transition, it might be a modified version of the QCD phase transition, but it cannot be a modified version of the electroweak phase transition because then we would be talking about higher temperatures, higher frequencies, and would not be able to see it with the PTA. Okay, I understood. Thank you.